Let's turn back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12 this morning. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his word. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, although it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. If you've attended Wednesday night Bible studies here, you may recall that when they begin, like the, the first night, I encourage you in attendance to set aside your Christian experiences and your systems of doctrine in order to listen to the text. Now, when I've done that, I was not trying to invalidate your experiences, and I certainly wasn't interested in separating you from sound teaching. My purpose was, my purpose is, to clear a path for the biblical text itself, so that it's the, the, the best word I can use to describe it is fresh, fresh to us. For people who have been Christians for as long as many of us have been Christians, the Bible can become like a book on the necessity of exercise and healthy eating. Whenever I read one, I sincerely believe what it's telling me. But my belief that that book is telling me the truth does not by itself translate into me putting what it recommends into practice. In fact, I may actually be reading such a book while I'm eating a foot-long BMT at Subway 
with black olives, banana peppers, tomato, and mayonnaise, and Diet Coke mixed with lemonade. So I'm nodding and thinking this is what I should be doing. And in some ways, my familiarity with the material actually counts against me because it's no longer fresh. It doesn't grab me any longer. Deeply ingrained habits and lifestyles, sometimes 30 or 40 years in the making, do not surrender meekly. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we open 1 Peter, even as I repeat that thought experiment. In this case, let's pretend. Let's pretend that we are Bithynian believers. We'll pick one of these regions out. We're, we're from Bithynia. And Peter's letter has just arrived in our congregation. But what he has to say to us, and I'm, this is going to be the stress this morning and probably in the coming weeks, what he has to say to us depends on how ready we are to accept and embrace the identity he gives us in the very first verse. What he has to say to us depends on, assumes, builds on how ready we are to accept and embrace the identity that he assigns to us in the very first verse, in his salutation, in his greetings. It's not just us, us Christians in sort of a general and even generic sense. It's us Christians who are the elect exiles of the dispersion. If you fall here, then everything that follows, you can still benefit from it, of course, it's the word of God, but it's assuming that you accept and embrace what Peter describes you to be. Well, part of us likes these opening verses. We're a reformed congregation. So we warm right up to eclectos plus prognosis, that we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God, right? That's our wheelhouse, chosen by God. R.C. Sproul's book way back in the 80s, I think. But in the actual text, the adjective elect or chosen is joined in some way to another adjective. I'm going to give you the word. It's pare pedemos, pare pedemos, pertaining to staying for a while in a strange or foreign place, sojourning, residing temporarily. So says the Greek lexicon. And so Joel Green points out a problem for us. What makes 1 Peter difficult to read as Christian scripture is this initial attempt on the part of Peter to identify his audience. 1 Peter is addressed to folks who do not belong, who eke out their lives on the periphery of acceptable society, whose deepest loyalties and inclinations do not line up very well with what matters most in the world in which they live. And in a case of understatement, he concludes, this is not the sort of life that most people find attractive. No, it isn't. And you might say that one of the ironic privileges that freedom and prosperity convey to Christians is that we can, 
yeah, under our breath or maybe only in our minds, say no thank you to the Bible. We treat the Bible sort of like a smorgasbord. Oh, here's a metaphor we love. We're the children of God. Let's talk all about being the children of God. Now, God is our Father. I love that metaphor. I use it frequently. But then there's another one over here. Elect exiles of the dispersion. Eh. Children of God. God is our Father. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep who lays down his life for us and so forth. So in a sense, we can sort of skim over that and say, well, it's just a metaphor. Well, there are a lot of just a metaphors in the Bible that are very important to us, and we aren't allowed to pick and choose among them. So here we are, Park Woods Presbyterian Church, elect according to God's foreknowledge. You've come to the right place. Let's go over this one more time. Resident aliens in the diaspora? Oh, that's just our transitory life as we make our way through this world on our pilgrimage to heaven. I already indicated that's not true. So that won't do. And so this is either good news or bad news. I'm going to dedicate two weeks to just two verses in the opening of 1 Peter. And I'm going to divide it into two parts. You can remember these, if it helps, that God has created a people for himself. That's next week, Lord willing. This morning, the people that God has created for himself. So next week, God has created a people. This week, who are those people? And that will be Lord willing, the next two sermons. And so really, I have just one kind of major point this morning, that we are the elect or chosen sojourners of the diaspora. And that is a mouthful. We are the elect or chosen, whichever you like, sojourners of the diaspora. And this is relevant even to our worship this morning. We thanked God this morning and praised him because the Lord builds up Jerusalem and he gathers the diaspora of Israel. That's a redemptive category from the Old Testament. He, gather, he builds up Jerusalem and in relationship to that, he gathers his dispersed people. And that's what we're discussing this morning. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the elect sojourners of the diaspora. Now, some of you may not even know what those words mean. I'm thinking of the younger people, but you never know. Well, the Greek text is actually not very complicated. But you wouldn't know that if you sat down and surveyed a number of the English versions. I've read our, our ESV to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. King James has to the strangers scattered. The NET has to those temporarily residing abroad who are chosen. The New Living Translation has to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces. NIV has to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus. 
and the New Jerusalem has to all those living as aliens in the dispersion who have been chosen. Now, as I said, the differences among the English versions do not reflect a complicated Greek text. They reflect certain challenges in getting that Greek text into a readable translation that is accessible to people who read English. The King James's strangers scattered through Pontus, I think, obscures Peter's point. The NET, the New English translation, is misleading to those temporarily residing abroad. It makes the Christians sound like college students who are taking a semester in Europe. Though it's footnote, and if you want to see footnotes in a Bible, you've got to read the New English translation. The footnotes do a better job. The New Living Translation kind of misses the point. The New International Version shrinks sojourners of the diaspora into a more generic scattered throughout, which misses the point. But the ESV and the New Jerusalem Bible are easily the best of the lot. As long as you know what words mean, especially exile, sojourner, resident alien, and dispersion. Dispersion quite properly with an upper, uppercase D. So this short survey helps to make my argument that Peter's elect sojourners of the diaspora is really a redemptive historical metaphor that is weighted with a meaning that Peter, from the very first verse, assigns to or imposes on the Christians. And if we either do not know that meaning, or worse, resist it, or just reject it outright, then the rest of Peter's letter will be diminished. Its message, while true and inspired, will be weakened on our end. The letter, in short, depends on this metaphor. So choose ye this day whether you will accept or reject it. As for me in my house, I don't know, just sounded cool. So let's look at those words, elect or chosen sojourners of the diaspora. That title carries within it levels of meaning and identity that all by itself, before there's really any exposition, identifies the believers and their place in the world, and by extension, their way of life in the world. And going back to my life's great questions point in the first sermon, which I'm going to revisit on occasion, this is God's answer to our question, who are we? <coughs> who are we? And to understand it better, I'm going to break it down into its parts and then put it back together to see what the whole means. Now, the, 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 the elect or chosen language really is familiar to us Reformed folk. The adjective means pertaining to being selected, chosen. And the verb means to pick out someone or something, to choose for oneself. When Luther came to this verse, he said, the human doctrine of free will and of our own powers no longer amounts to anything. Our will is unimportant. 
God's will and choosing are decisive. Well, in the final analysis, Luther is correct, but he, he skipped at least one crucial step in the interpretive process. When you see language of election joined to language of knowledge or foreknowledge, it's Israel language. So already in chapter 1, verse 1, Peter is using language, he's using titles that were once used for Israel under Moses. I'll give you some examples. Deuteronomy 4.37, the examples are important because of what they, how they fill out the idea of election. And because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them, he elected their offspring, that's our verb, and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before the nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in, to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Know therefore today and lay it to your heart that Yahweh is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. You could really take almost everything in Moses' statement and transfer it to the people of God under the new covenant all the way down to taking them from one place and delivering them safely and graciously into another. And how it proceeds out of his love, which is an electing love, Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. For you are a people holy to Yahweh your God. Yahweh our God has chosen you to be a people, not our word, by the way, for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that Yahweh set his love on you and chose you. He elected you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because Yahweh loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that Yahweh has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And one more briefly, Deuteronomy 14, 2, for you are a people holy, right? There's holiness in verse 2 here. Holy to Yahweh your God, and Yahweh has elected you, chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So, conversations about election, when the opponent rejects election, are important dogmatic conversations. But if you jump straight to the free will versus bondage of the will debate, you may miss what's the most obvious, that Peter is saying, you are Israel, and you have participated in a great exodus. But our second word, parepidemos, sojourner, well, we'll, well, that's a rare word in the Bible. It only occurs five times Old and New Testaments and for good measure the Apocrypha and only twice in the Old Testament. It means pertaining to staying for a while in a strange or foreign place, sojourning, residing temporarily. In our literature, stranger, sojourner, resident alien. Its verb form, which is nowhere in the Greek Bible, means to stay for a short time in a strange place. And that's all I'm going to say about that now. I'm going to hold off on that bit so that we can now move to that third crucial word, elect, sojourner, 
of the diaspora. Diaspora. It's actually taken over completely from the original Greek language. It means, one, state or condition of being scattered, dispersion of those who are dispersed. Two, the place in which the dispersed are found, that is, dispersion or diaspora. A lot of dictionary this morning, I recognize that, but we need it because these words are important. Have you ever been to a Seder? Some of you have, I have, I've been to a couple of them. Well, when a traditional Seder ends, it ends with the words, next year in Jerusalem. And there's kind of a painful irony in those words because the Seder recalls the night that Israel escaped Egypt and began its journey to the land God promised to the forefathers, but unless 1967 has some meaning, the Seder that remembered the Exodus is being held in the diaspora, in all the lands where the Jews have been dispersed. And the diaspora is a place where God's people mourn. One of the most famous diaspora-related diaspora songs is Psalm 137. How shall we sing Yahweh's song in a foreign land? And if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Jerusalem is our home city, the psalmist believes. And so here's my sense of it. When you join Pare Pademos with Diasporos, it creates a very powerful and very poignant image. Now there is, of course, an Old Testament background to Diaspora, which allows Peter to sort of just use it like a composer uses a minor key. And here are two examples that shed light on it, but with a surprise twist at the end. O oh God, turn your mercy, right, verse 3, turn your mercy upon us and have compassion for us. Bring together the diaspora of Israel with mercy and goodness because your faithfulness is with us. And another psalm, when Israel was deported into exile to a foreign country, when they turned away from the Lord who had redeemed them, they were thrown away from the inheritance which the Lord had given them. The dispersion of Israel was among every nation, according, that's diaspora, according to the saying of God, so that your righteousness might be proved right, O God, in our lawlessness, for you are a righteous judge over all the peoples of the earth. Now my little surprise twist there is those psalms are not canonical. They are not the psalms, they are the psalms of Solomon. And I think there could be an advantage, we'll get to the canonical books in the future, but an advantage to even consider a non-canonical book because the time when that book was written was written much closer to the date when Peter wrote to his dispersion, his diaspora, maybe within 100 or 150 years. So what I'm getting at here, try and speak plainly, when you have a word like 
diaspora. A word like that is not only heard, right? So you hear it and the dictionary in your brain in a flash translates its meaning and puts it in the sentence that was used. <clears throat> Words like that are also felt. That is, their meaning can't be reduced to the dictionary. They have a meaning, right? And so by, just by analogy, I want to use a word that's not the same, because it could be confusing, but it, it's, a, it's a word that's dictionary defined and has meaning. It's felt. The word is homeless. Look up homeless in the dictionary. It means, no surprise, having no home or permanent place of residence. So I could say honestly that from the time that Marcia and I and Harrison and Connor left Massachusetts to the time we moved into the rental house on 103rd Street, we were homeless. Don't feel bad for us. We just didn't have a permanent place of residence yet. So we stayed in a couple of motels, we stayed with a family in a church, in the church, and then we were no longer homeless. I'm not passing the hat. But if we add just one word, the definite article, the meaning of the word undergoes a significant change. The homeless. That word, the, makes a huge difference, doesn't it? It doesn't conjure up a, 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 a handsome and idealistic young couple with their two beautiful children traveling from Massachusetts to Kansas. I'm glad you didn't laugh. That means you believed that. <clears throat> it conjures up in our imaginations instead grocery carts filled with possessions that may not even be meaningful to any outside observer. It conjures up images of mental illness and drug abuse, of exposure to the elements, of cardboard boxes, of living under bridges, of exploitable people who are never very safe in the world. We fear being homeless in that sense, and we pity the victims of it. Now, to be clear, I am not suggesting that diaspora makes us the homeless. It doesn't. Jerusalem is our home, and we long to be there, but that's not the point of the metaphor. I think Peter takes for granted that the word diaspora, when it modifies a word like sojourner or resident alien, resonates with his Christians because they get what that word means at that feeling level. It suggests displacement, vulnerability, minority status, and even that ever-present sense of unease that they are not, in fact, where they belong because they, in fact, belong somewhere else. It's as if we're just kind of out of sync with the way that the world works. 
What's important about this immediately is diaspora is behind verse 6's various trials. Those are diaspora trials. But blessedly, the diaspora various trials is softened by one sixes for a little while. So diaspora goes with various trials and sojourner resident alien goes with for a little while. And both of these together bring our focus to one four's inheritance. Inheritance is the living space of our future. And if that's the case, then diaspora is our living space for now, in the present. This comes to us from Peter, who is what? An apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter does know that we're Christians. He speaks to us as Christians in chapter 4. But you've got to get hold of this and then hold on to it. He much more specifically speaks to us as the elect sojourners of the diaspora. And you must hear him because the speaker and the audience must be in basic agreement about at least two things, who they are and then who they are in relationship to each other. In this case, Peter is Jesus' apostle and we are the sojourners of the diaspora. If drill instructor Jonathan Brooks were standing where I'm standing and spoke to you like men and women that he had to get into shape for the army, you wouldn't get it. Nothing he said would apply to you. If Andy Reid were standing where I'm standing, and started reviewing the types of offense, defense, and special team strategies that he's going to use today against the Ravens, you'd be going, how did you get here? Aren't you supposed to be in Baltimore? He wouldn't make any sense because you're not recruits for the military and you're not the Kansas City Chiefs who play football for a living. If Peter were standing where I am standing and spoke to you like Christians who owned the world and only needed to claim it for King Jesus, then what he actually writes in the letter is nonsense. So I encourage you to set aside your Christian experiences and your systems of doctrine so that you may listen to the text as the people that God himself has made who are the elect sojourners of the diaspora. And I do this to clear a path for the biblical text itself so that it is fresh and it is spiritual so that we're not all going through our Sunday morning motions out of our 30 or 40 years of ingrained habits and lifestyles. Let's pray. Our Father, it is very satisfying and reassuring to us that it was out of your great love and mercy that you chose us to be your people. 
and that all the benefits of Christ's life and death have been applied to us by the Holy Spirit, who himself has united us to our risen Savior and King. But Father, help us to be as enthusiastic about an identity or titles that may not resonate as well in our hearts and minds because they impose things upon us that we naturally shy from. Help us to see that being the elect sojourners in a diaspora is itself an expression of your great mercy and that this identity belongs to us because you have caused us to be born again. And what goes along with it is a living hope and an inheritance that cannot perish, that cannot fade, that cannot spoil, and is kept in heaven for us, even while your power keeps us in the world. Help us to be faithful with our full identity and live our lives accordingly. And now we pray. Meet with us here at the Lord's table, for we ask you to set apart the bread and the wine from their common everyday use to their sacred use in worship so that it is the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is, in this sense, a meal for people who have no permanent residence in this world, but it's as if the Lord reaches from that invisible realm into this one in order to build us up in our faith and assure us with his love and his mercy. We receive it thankfully and return our praise and thanksgiving to you through Christ. Amen. Metaphors are very powerful ways to communicate truths, and we can't write them off as figures of speech, as if figures of speech means pretend. Metaphors are true. We are living stones in God's temple. We are the temple of God. That's just pregnant with meaning from the history of redemption. Jesus Christ is the great shepherd of the sheep. And even so, he's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's sheep and shepherd. That's how metaphors work. And so with this one, we are indeed elect, but we are also in a form of exile. I will develop that further on living in a diaspora, like the scattered of Israel. But Jesus can meet with us even here, outside the safe boundaries of the holy city, the Jerusalem that is above, he can still meet with us. And he does so powerfully by taking bread and wine, such ordinary items for consumption and nourishment and saying, this is my body, and this is my blood, and what's being done here at the table is being done for you. And so let's appreciate the full weight of our identity so that we might increasingly live it out according to all the directions and encouragements and commands and promises that Peter will reveal throughout his epistle always coming back to this, that this is not only where we began, but this is where we are sustained, and it represents our living hope. Next year in Jerusalem. If you're not a Christian this morning, then please don't come to the Lord's table. It is a meal that Jesus separates his disciples, his brothers and sisters for himself. You may come and speak to me or one of the elders about what it means to be a Christian, 
but don't participate in our meal. But to the rest, the Lord says to you, as he said at the beginning of the worship service, grace and peace, come and eat and drink with me, your risen Savior.